Hello and welcome to Stories from the Wire, the AppNeta podcast, where we talk to the experts about the most pressing app and network issues facing the enterprise today and tell you how to work smarter, not harder, to speed up resolution. I'm Paul Davenport, AppNeta's resident tech journalist, and each week we're going to dive into a specific issue that we've helped an IT team tackle. Today and over the coming weeks, we're looking at work from home, perhaps the hot topic of the past year, and how enterprises are optimizing their infrastructure to support a work from anywhere future. According to the 2021 AFCOM Data Center Report, businesses continue their march toward a hybrid cloud future as on-prem enterprise data center construction is shrinking for the foreseeable future. Now, we want to make it clear that we're not saying that on-prem data centers are going away, right? Absolutely not. Let me throw some numbers at you. According to the report, 80% of IT leaders said their enterprise is not building any on-prem data centers today. 72% said they won't be building any within the year. And 62% don't anticipate a need for new data centers within the next three years. Now, this all comes as fewer businesses are repatriating workloads that had moved to the cloud back to on-premise, with 60% of respondents taking this action today compared to 70% in 2020. Our guests today are going to give us their take on what all this data means for the future of network management, IT priorities, and how to balance your cloud, on-prem, and hybrid workloads without losing sight of end users. Take us there. I welcome back our product marketing guru, Alec Pinkham, and AppNet's own VP of product, Sean Armstrong. To kick Alec. things off, maybe a loaded question, but in working with enterprise customers, what would you say has been the overall attitude toward the corporate data center lately? Any enterprise customers who may have gone all cloud, for instance, or on the flip side, those who have reversed their cloud migrations. Just what are you hearing out there? There's definitely a number of trends uh, we've identified within our customer base. Uh, we've come to the point where companies can take a uh, optimization angle to what used to be really a survival question. At the beginning of COVID, when you know people didn't really have the opportunity to optimize how and where apps were hosted, they needed to just make sure their apps were accessible to their employees that were now working remotely. And that led to a lot of apps being shifted to the cloud simply to maintain access for, for really this distributed workforce. There were a large number of uh, corporate entities we worked with at the very beginning of COVID that attempted to host everything internally and had major points of congestion at VPN concentrators. And that led them to really shift that workload and that data up to the cloud that are really designed for very large scale remote data access. Now that things have settled down a bit, uh, they may have an idea of where some of their employees are going to be in the long term. They're able to really evaluate which apps make sense to host in the public cloud and which may, which apps make sense to bring back to the corporate data center to really optimize for cost when before it was just, I need to make sure these were accessible to have people do their day-to-day -day jobs. Yeah, and you mentioned repatriating, which I think is an interesting point because there are a couple of core cohorts when you think of data center apps, and one of those is legacy apps. I think over the course of the pandemic, you saw a lot of those legacy apps actually get replaced, even if they had been on a roadmap to be replaced over the next three, five years. I think a lot of them were hustled into a new realm, which a lot of uh, were probably cloud based. So to that point, you're saying that a lot of legacy apps got retired during the pandemic and whole new apps were brought on. And it's not necessarily so much repatriating as maybe going back to the old way or unpack that a little bit. There are a lot of different apps that were in the data center and probably will go back to the data center, things for privacy or compliance reasons. We see that kind of across the world with a bunch of new regulations around that. So those apps may have never left the data center. They may have had components that left the data center that are now going back. So I think there are cohorts that are going back to the data center. And depending on who you ask and who you're reading, they're going to make the case for going back to the data center versus not based on you know where they have a stake. Got it. And okay. this is a this is definitely a case where um, when you shift apps to the cloud, you can definitely do what's what is generally called a forklift, where you take a legacy application, not really designed with a cloud architecture in mind, but you can deploy it in the cloud and it will operate, it will run. Um, but a lot of companies are finding out that the costs of hosting them in the cloud can add up very, very quickly. And while it's necessary to keep the business running, you know, at the beginning days of COVID, they're now at the point where I need to optimize. I need to figure out where cost savings can be had uh, while still maintaining the employee access that is necessary. Hence, you know, key applications that are still necessary to run the business, but may, may not be required constantly by a remote workforce. They may be the ones coming back um, inside the corporate data center. It really is going to vary company by company where that sort of cost versus access trade-off is going to uh, end up. Yeah, I think that's a huge point, especially when you're talking about the architecture, right? Cloud apps are meant to have bursting capabilities or just micro 
segmentation so that if you're accessing specific types of data, you're trying to limit that based on the cost of whatever the storage mechanism is. So I think you're seeing a lot of those apps get reconsidered now. Okay. So it's it's fair to say that it basically comes down to, A, there's a security and compliance component. There's the cost component that kind of blankets over everything. And then, but it ultimately comes down to what user experience is going to be from where that app is hosted. Is that fair to say? It is. And I think a lot of corporate data centers, clearly there there is access to them, but they weren't designed for really high volume, uh, highly distributed workforces. So um, there may be you know, key choke points, key bottlenecks, what everyone is expected to route back through, which can be a challenge that you know, has the added benefit of security and compliance um, positives that you can evaluate all connections and make sure only the people accessing the data are those who should be. But uh, it also means those uh, choke points have to be capable of handling the, these you know, peak workloads when you, know, you're, you have the most employees accessing it for the longest periods of time. That, you know, has its own cost considerations. So there's definitely cases where, you know, on any given day, um, if your app is designed for the cloud, you can host it efficiently. Uh, you burst up the resources needed when uh, access is at its highest. But if you don't have the ability to turn that down when access is low, your bills are going to really explode on you. Okay. Now, there's actually an interesting stat that um, only 60% of enterprises are even planning to repatriate this year, which seems high, but last year it was 70%. Why do we think that's going down? Are we just getting, is the cloud getting better at supporting our workloads? Are we getting better at managing the cloud? Um, what do you think might be attributed here? And do you actually think that's an accurate estimate? Number, But I do think that there's two trends there. Management of the cloud and in particular uh, managing workload within the cloud to optimize the best sort of price versus performance um, trade-off is, is definitely something that tools do exist. These tools work very well to, to make sure you understand where the money is being spent and make sure um, you're using it efficiently. But probably the biggest change is, you know, people may have had the initial assumption that after COVID, all my employees are just coming back in the office and we'll go back to how things were. And uh, as we're seeing some very big name players in the tech space, that may not be the case. Um, your employees have additional benefits and that probably have a better work-life balance when they're able to work from home. And a lot of companies, you know, they may have people coming back in the office a few days a week, but the fact that they are working from home several days a week means you need to maintain uh, remote access in a very, uh, you know, performance sensitive class of users. All right. So what does the repatriation process actually involve? Again, another loaded question, but I mean, what metrics or data needs to be monitored throughout the process? Yeah. When I think about the repatriation process, one of the things that comes to mind is that if you had an application that was on-prem before the pandemic and you switched to either a new application for the time of the pandemic or potentially just use the cloud offering of that same application, there, there might be a way to just turn that one back on. And I think the process for repatriation really should be focused on the users. And just like we see in larger scale transformations, using pilot groups and identifying their experience over the course of you know, a full work week uh, maybe longer just to understand what may have changed, right? If we have a lot more remote users today, then getting their access and their traffic through into the network of the office, we need to make sure that still works, especially because those users used to be in the office and you may have uh, DMZ firewall issues that you haven't considered. And, and looking at that application delivery path is going to be pretty important when you're looking at serving end users that are used to getting fast access to applications that they use potentially in the cloud before and potentially right. from the office before that. So we need to look at the full end user experience, but I, I think that's going into metrics like uh, capacity, jitter, latency loss, things like that. Yeah, and understanding all of the points of access for these applications is also key. Um, as you move it back to on-premise, you know, in your, your hybrid data center world, you need to know not just where your users are coming from, but all automated uh, connection points. If this is in a you know tightly coupled system where data is retrieved via API for use within external tools, you need to understand where uh, those connections are coming from, which ones are still going to be coming from the cloud. Because I think this is a case where you know the hybrid cloud world we're living in is really going to vary on an app by app basis. 
which apps should live in your off your corporate data center, which should live in public cloud, which are going to be SaaS services. And um, in the most evolved uh, corporations, there's lots of automation between these tools. So it's not only where are my users going to be coming from to access the web front end for, for this app, what are my integrations? Um, what external tools are going to be pulling this data? And do I have the right security in place to make sure I don't break these integrations while still maintaining you know, privacy and compliance regulations? All right. Yeah. So not the biggest takeaway, but a big takeaway is that it has to be done app by app. You can't take a wholesale approach to your workflows and just decide cloud or not cloud. It's all going to be hybrid going forward. Now, what, in your opinion, is going to be the split when it comes to data centers and clouds and hybrid cloud and co-location going forward? Do you think that we will see a more defined, maybe 50-50 split? Or do you think it's going to just be variable and that, I don't know, there could be another wrench stone in the works like we saw last May? I think companies are definitely coming to terms with public cloud that, you know, if I spoke to large financials a couple of years ago, it was just out of the question that they're never going to host anything in public cloud. And now the logic seems to be of these highly sensitive industries. If it is very sensitive data, it is, you know, the keys to the kingdom, my corporate data, my finance data, my medical records, those need to stay on premise where I have full control over the environment. Um, any apps that don't really have that super sensitive information, it may make sense to move them out to public cloud or SaaS services based on you know, the access required by my remote employees and what is the best sort of financial decision for the corporation to make. Um, you know, people that dismiss this out of hand are now very open to making these transitions, but it all depends on the sensitivity of the data in use. And I think we mentioned cloud apps before having segmentations, and I think we're seeing that even in the medical industry where they could have one app that actually lives both on-prem and in the cloud, right? In a hybrid model where some data is held on-prem, private, uh, secure, and then metadata or other information that could be useful, scheduling tools, things like that, could live in the cloud and basically work together, but have separate subsystems that kind of work together to make an entire app. Gotcha. So it's going to continue to be an ecosystem for the foreseeable future. It's not all in one way or the other necessarily. And it's also very segmented by vertical and industry, which I mean, what isn't? Yeah, but I would yeah. say at this point, after this past year, a lot more is going to be in the cloud than we had before, because there's a lot of things that companies, potentially enterprises didn't think was possible that IT may have known was possible, but knew their company would never would go for it. We're, we're starting to see those shifts. And I think it's going to be a little bit hard for a lot of those to shift back. Yeah, that's probably the single biggest change is that, you know, COVID forced a lot of uh, evolution of companies that were hesitant to, to um, change before. And that is going to continue. Uh, probably that the single biggest change isn't hybrid data centers. It is a hybrid workforce. It is going to be remote. They're going to be, you know, going between office and home locations on a day by day basis. And that level of location fluidity of where your people are coming from requires you to have apps and data that is accessible from pretty much anywhere. And that leads you to cloud in most scenarios. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of the million dollar question too. Dare I ask, what do you think the split's going to be in terms of hybrid work going forward? Do you have a stake in the ground here? It's hard to say is the big answer from everybody, but what's your take? Yeah. The, the single biggest answer is it's pretty much never going to be a hundred percent one or the other. Um, I think that the best case scenario Employees see huge benefit in you know meeting with their team members, uh, meeting face to face. There's a lot of uh, camaraderie. There's a lot of you know company culture that's built that way, and everyone wants to maintain that. But there's a lot of benefit in not having a commute and you know being able to to better have a you know solid work life balance. So if I had to bet, I would say you know two to three days a week in the office, two to three days a week from home is what I'd see most um, organizations shaking out. But a lot of it depends on, do you need physical uh, employees in a physical office? And you know that's gonna vary industry by industry. Absolutely, what about you, Alec? Any hot takes here? Yeah, I mean, I just think you're gonna see, you're gonna see that culture shift with a lot of remote work. Uh, I, I agree, I think it's gonna be, you know, two to three depending on the job role, but obviously there's gonna be a culture of people who are in the office uh, for, you know, for whatever reason, if they need to be in the office for five days, there's going to be kind of a culture split with the people who need to be in the office and the people who are remote. And so I'm interested to see how that plays out, but uh, that kind of uh, conflict uh, could, 
could get a little bit tough in, in some industries. Absolutely. Yeah. But the big takeaway from all of it is you need a strong network foundation to make any of this work, whether you're in office, whether you're home, whether it's two or three days a week, whether you're all the time hopping on from your kitchen. Thanks again, Sean and Alec. And thank you listeners for joining us on Stories from the Wire, the AppNeta podcast. Subscribe to our feed to get the latest tips and tricks every week on how to manage network performance for the future of work.